respiratory rate increases. Blood is directed into our muscles and limbs. Pupils dilate. Awareness intensifies. Sight sharpens. Impulses quicken. Perception of pain diminishes. Immune system mobilizes with increased activation. We become prepared, physically and psychologically, for fight or flight. This happens every time a police or fireman hears an alarm or is put in harm's way. During this, the heart rate can go from arresting 70 beats per minute to 140 or more beats per minute in a matter of seconds. Right now we're responding to a reported uh, wildland fire. It's actually in uh, Reno Fires District. And in five stories. Friends and neighbors, helping neighbors and friends. You can right cancel. Now. This is a controlled burn. You can cancel. So it's kind of a controlled burn, so now you're going to cancel everything. Fight or flight response happens even when the call gets canceled. This is our logbook. So each one of these red things is a call. And, and for us, like this is a lot yesterday. Um, this is 8 o'clock at night. And so they went out, you know, between 8 and, and 10, three or four times. But after 10 o'clock when normal people are sleeping, they went out at 10.20, uh, 10.48, 10.56, 11.15, 1, you know, 12 o'clock, 2 o'clock, 5 o'clock, 5.15, 6.45, and 6.55. I can give you a to-go bottle. Bite or flight response happens even when it's during dinner. We're like Pavlov's dogs. The beeper goes off and our body starts preparing for action. Some of our old guys told me when I got hired, no, that alarm doesn't, it doesn't affect me anymore. We're so used to it, we don't realize it's affecting us. But when we put the monitoring devices on, we see physiological changes that are represented by an increase in blood pressure and an increase in heart rate. The years of, of doing this job, waking up in the middle of the night, lack of sleep, uh, maybe a lack of nutrition. It's not a regular nine to five job where you know we eat breakfast at eight, we eat lunch at 12, and we eat dinner at six. Well, sometimes we, we don't get to eat breakfast. Uh, sometimes there's been times it's been three o'clock and I haven't eaten anything all day because you're running calls or doing, you know, you're busy. So years and years and years of, of, sh of stress like that put, puts a toll on you. We're all having financial challenges in our departments, but the one thing that you can do to manage unfunded liability like heart and lung benefits or a member's disease is by doing prevention, early detection, and the only way that's going to happen is by doing yearly physicals. Fortunately, uh, we, we do have annual physicals that we have to go to, and we do blood work, we do cholesterol, so a lot of those we could find precursors of, of any medical problems that, that could hurt us down the road. Every year, our law enforcement officers and firefighters die needlessly or are disabled from strokes, heart attacks, or some form of cardiovascular disease. The U.S. healthcare system has fallen short of preventing these needless and costly deaths. Prevention starts with identifying who is at risk before a heart attack occurs. In 2001, Specialty Health was approached by the risk manager for the University of Nevada. He needed help stopping the unnecessary deaths and disabilities occurring within his police departments. Under the heart-lung bill in Nevada and in many other states, it is presumed that if a sworn officer has an event, um, a heart-lung problem, that it gets paid for under workers' compensation. So it becomes our responsibility to manage that risk at that point. That's how we, as a workers' compensation musculoskeletal based company, got connected with wellness and prevention and uh, the annual physical that the officer had to have every year in reviewing those. By 2006, Specialty Health had reviewed thousands of annual police and fire physicals. What they found shocked them. Many, many untreated and undiagnosed young men and women with cardiovascular disease, diabetes, hypertension, and cholesterol problems. Walking time bombs. We Absolutely. saw people dying, young men dying of heart attacks and having strokes. And uh, it was 
for unnecessary reasons. Cardiovascular disease is the leading cause of death in the nation and has been since the beginning of the century. An estimated 935,000 heart attacks occur each year. 50% of the time, the first warning sign is death. What happens is that there's no practical application. There may be a statin you can throw at it, but no one quite on the, on the practical side of the primary care doctor or even a cardiologist understand how to treat uh, the problem. Death rates alone cannot describe the burden of heart disease and stroke. In 2010, the cost was a staggering $503 billion in health care expenditures and lost productivity from deaths and disability. So there's a huge gap between research and practical application right. for, for a population of people. We're looking at great pockets of research being done on cancer and, and um, cardiovascular disease and Alzheimer's, and they're all compartmentalized. They all have their own silos of information. The country has so been focused on cholesterol or high LDL cholesterol as the cause of heart disease. And this has been, I truly think, and maybe I shouldn't say this, but certainly catered to by the enormous efforts the pharmaceutical companies that have drugs that lower cholesterol have advertisements on the radio and the television, whatever. Uh, they sponsor a lot of the education that physicians get in this country. Ten years later, what we know is that treatment as usual may get you killed. You must be able to identify someone at risk before the onset of cardiovascular disease. Today, the Cardiac Wellness Program has diagnosed and treated thousands of young men and women who protect us 24 hours a day. Specialty Health believes they have saved lives and provided patients with a better quality of life through a constant search for better ways to prevent cardiovascular disease. For me, I, I wouldn't go to the doctor. Like, I'm 28, I'm like, I have no, I don't no feel bad, so why would I go to the doctor? Wellness is really, to me, critical for the young employees and for the people who look perfectly healthy and who have what traditionally we would be considered absolutely no risk according to their uh, lipid panels. Medical information can often be confusing. That's why Specialty Health developed the Big Five chart or the red light, green light chart, a way patients could easily understand when they are at risk for cardiovascular and related diseases. Everybody in public safety understands what a red light means and what a yellow light means, what a green light means. And so over time, we evolved to four sets of data. On the upper part of the graph here where you see the yellow and green lights, those yellow and green lights reflect what public health talks about as the big five. The weight issues, the blood pressure issues, the smoking issues, the lipid issues here, and sugar here, and then we total up those lights over on the far column uh, in red, yellow, and green. It includes a Framingham risk score that predicts a 10-year risk of a heart attack. This is used by many practitioners. Framingham is interesting. It's, it's very statistically accurate to give you the risk of having a heart attack within the next 10 years. Framingham is heavily age-related and Framingham missed some things that we thought were important. Age-related um, being the younger you are, the, the less at are, risk the you're less going likely to appear. you're going to have a heart attack in the, in the next 10 years, no matter how bad you are. Well, that wasn't what we were looking for. We were looking for the young guy who was going to surprise us. One of the problems with wellness programs is that you plans tend to couple them with disease management programs. So you identify the ones that are already sick and you try to manage them and get them to a better place and reduce their risks. What we tend to ignore, because they don't cost us a lot of money right now, are the low risk ones. And we need to keep them at the low risk level. So we need to be talking with them early on about their identifying potential risks and keeping all those green lights and not let them advance into the yellows and certainly not the reds because once you do that you're back in a disease management state. Hey, I'm Todd Renwick, commander with the University of Nevada Reno Police Department. 
I, I've been in law enforcement for coming up on 19 years. Before that, I worked out on the street as a patrol officer and as a supervisor. About six years ago, uh, Dr. Greenwald contacted us, um, got a hold of me, and wanted to uh, talk about a cardiac wellness program for law enforcement officers. I was uh, in, in the process of training for a marathon uh, during all this and uh, getting ready to go back and attend the FBI Academy uh, in Quantico, Virginia. Um, and I got a phone call from, from Dr. Greenwald about my lipids. and. Uh, he said uh, he had some concerns and uh, definitely wanted to talk to me about it, and uh, it was quite the shock. Todd's situation is similar to that of well-known marathoner Jim Fix. Fix was considered the godfather of modern fitness until he fell to his sudden death at age 52 while running. After he died at an unnecessarily early age, autopsies found that all three of his coronary arteries were damaged by arterial sclerosis. Fix, who ran 10 miles a day, of all people, was considered fit. Just because you were physically fit doesn't mean you aren't at risk. Genetics plays a huge role in determining cardiovascular risk. We've come a long way in cardiac research since Fix died in 1984. Now we have advanced testing and cholesterol medications. When you see that, that you're internally unhealthy, but you've been doing uh, what you think all the right things by maintaining exercise and a fairly decent diet. Uh, you know, I'll admit my diet um, isn't always great, um, but when you learn that uh, potentially you're at risk for heart, di heart disease, it's an eye-opener and it's scary. When I began a program with Dr. Greenwald and started taking the lipids and uh, went back and saw that my cholesterol points almost dropped uh, uh, 100 points, it was uh, jaw-dropping. That really that was um, one of the only uh, major things I had to do in my life and that was uh, look at taking some medication. We didn't know about insulin resistance in 2005 when we first saw Todd. Retrospective calculations show that Todd had an insulin resistance score of 7.29, which is high. Due to a combination of genetics and lifestyle, many of us are insulin resistant. The estimate is 30% of the American population. Insulin resistance, although unknown by many physicians today, was first discovered by Stanford endocrinologist Dr. Gerald Reven in 1981. Technically, in insulin-sensitive or normally functioning individuals, insulin does its job of transporting glucose into cells properly. In insulin-resistant individuals, the cells in your body don't respond properly to insulin's call to accept glucose or sugar from the blood into your fat or muscle cells. In response to this malfunction, the pancreas secretes more and more insulin into the bloodstream. In insulin-resistant individuals, fat gets trapped in the fat cells and can't be used properly for energy. So the fat cells just keep getting fatter. The problem with this and the reason I use the word philanthropic is that yes, by secreting more insulin, the pancreas is able to prevent a high blood glucose or diabetes, but unfortunately the high insulin can act on other organs in the body to lead to events which are not good for us, but if anything can end up make, making more likely that certain diseases will happen. So insulin resistance is the common thread not only for diabetes, but for heart attack, for stroke, for many blood pressure problems, on and on and on, polycystic ovarian disease, sleep apnea. Insulin resistance breast is the common cancer. thread. Breast cancer. Alzheimer's. Alzheimer's. It's the common Macular thread. It's insulin resistance is to us now the unified field theory of primary prevention. That's the thing you need to be looking for, that's the thing you need to identify, and that's the thing you need to be treating. If we identify those who are insulin resistant, which we can with a simple calculation, we can predict who will have cardiovascular disease 20 years before onset. That is prevention. Sometimes you may not completely understand it, but just the term insulin resistant um, kind of makes you think that it has something to do with diabetes and um, that your, your body um, isn't processing uh, sugars or insulin the right way and uh, it can turn around and uh, be detrimental to you. Um, it's scary. Not only is it 
I think, pr uh, very powerful in its ability to lead to a series of adverse clinical syndromes. It also, among the things we can deal with, is most within our control. So, for example, the country has focused for years on having a high LDL cholesterol as causing heart disease. And it does, there's no question about that. But most of the regulatory effects are genetic. So your ability to modify your LDL cholesterol concentration other than by having chosen different parents by diet and lifestyle is relatively marginal. Your ability to improve insulin resistance by lifestyle changes, exercise and diet is profound. Knowing that it's reversible and that you can uh, treat it and maintain it through either diet, uh, exercise or even possible medication does help. But <clears throat> there's always that thing in the back of your mind that says this is a long-term thing that I have to commit, commit to uh, in order to uh, stay healthy and live, live a, a long life. Since there has not been an obvious drug to treat insulin resistance, that I think it's got a lot less attention. It's also a little more complicated and therefore it requires more education and well, not that much more but it's a little more complicated than simply high LDL cholesterol means more heart disease and it's not been necessarily a major goal of anybody in this country. Uh, any of the associations have not focused on it that much. So, for a combination of a lot of reasons, it tends to be overlooked. Todd Renwick is the thin, very fit guy that is genetically predisposed to have insulin resistance. This is the Jim Fixes of the world. He had a 7.3 insulin resistance score. So when we look at all of the scores together, he was at 4% Framingham, which is very low risk. So no one would have known if you just looked at Framingham that he was at risk at all. And looking at his ATP3 Framingham score, it was one. And so they would not have known uh, that he was at risk looking at that. But when you start looking at his insulin resistance score of 7.29, he's very at risk. His insulin resistance is starting to go down. His small dense LDLs are um, improving. Um, that's medication, diet, and, uh, and he's continually been fit and exercises. But he's genetically predisposed, so he really, he was put on medications for that reason. You can't always rely on routine testing to identify your cardiovascular risk factors. Insulin resistance, we now feel, and so do many others, is the number one public health problem facing our country. Once we make the diagnosis, the first thing we do is put the patient on a low-carbohydrate diet. With a low-carbohydrate diet, what we'll see is a drop in the triglycerides and a, ra and, and a rise in the HDL by routine testing. The second thing we do is make sure that the patient's on an on a, uh, exercise program. With exercise, we know that insulin sensitivity can improve dramatically. The third thing we want to do is get the patient to lose some weight if weight is an issue. If a patient, who, if a patient who's overweight can lose 5% of their body weight, the entire metabolic picture can change dramatically. The fourth thing we do is we occasionally use diabetic medications like metformin. Metformin is an incredibly in interesting uh, medication that improves insulin sensitivity and on metformin sometimes the patients will lose weight. So the question is does it work? It works spectacularly well. Todd thought that his active lifestyle meant he should be eating lots of carbs. Like most of us, Todd has been misinformed. More and more evidence suggests that sugar and processed foods are toxic carbs. The science is so very clear. Sugar and the carbohydrates that form sugar in your body, quickly, those high glycemic index things are killing us. They're, they're simply killing us. 
we have another handout called the Gary Tobbs Message that we selected from um, his book. Uh, we recommend the book, but the, but the elements of the message are that carbohydrate is driving insulin, is driving fat. That's the secret. That's the Gary Tobbs message. We don't get fat because we overeat. We get fat because the carbohydrates in our diet make us fat. That's called the, that's called the carbohydrate hypothesis, and uh, we subscribe to that. But not in all people. Uh, not all people get fat. Right. So, and so, some people are so insulin resistant. Some people, can, thin. some people can be insulin resistant and, uh, and thin. Yeah. There's so much bull out there to read about diet and nutrition, and so little of it's backed up by good science. And this stuff is, and, and that's what's really critical to me. Being of Hispanic heritage, Having parents that were both, you know, type two diabetics, uh, you know, both uh, my father had, you know, coronary artery disease. Uh, I mean, all the cards were stacked against me, so mm -hmm. I was already, you know, when 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 I read the, the the handouts that you gave me, I was deeply concerned because, you know, high stress job, poor eating habits, overweight parents, history, genetics. I mean, uh, I was going to rush out and you know hit the mutual of Omaha people for more insurance. <laughs> now your physical. Um, we knew you'd have, we knew you'd have a, r a red light under BMI. Your BMI that we uh, we calculated was 32.6. Um, I think BMI in police and firefighters, on an individual level, can be extremely misleading. We've seen guys with BMIs of 32 with essentially no body fat. What's your ideal weight? We don't know that until we weigh you underwater. And that's one of the things we're going to want to do with you. What I see here is a really nice physical and the problems, sometimes we see multiple problems that we have to deal with and sort out. That's not the case with you. So one of the major things we look for when we uh, do your physical and analyze the data is insulin resistance. We think that is the critical, critical starting point. I'm actually going to incorporate a, a three day a week a physical fitness program. Hopefully we can get um, all my lights green on my chart. And ultimately that's that's the goal of any fire chief, any police chief, any type of uh, leader of an organization to, to set the example and to make sure that we can get as many participants as we can into a or, or, uh, program like this. The thing that we are concerned about with Mike is not only is he a little bit overweight, um, he has a family history of diabetes and heart disease. And so with a person like this, even though he's not insulin resistant, he doesn't have metabolic syndrome and he only has one red light, we would really want to look at him just a little bit further and see what's going on with his LDL particles. When we look at the risk factors this way, we can put the Framingham, the, uh, Framingham risk score, the ATP3 risk score, the metabolic risk score, the insulin resistance score, and we can look at advanced testing, and we can look at them all together. Most people that are evaluating cardiovascular risk today would look at the Framingham score and the ATP3 score, and they would put Mike at low risk. The point in looking at this is that Mike shows that he is not at risk based on routine testing. He's at moderate risk with his small particle LDLPs. Um, and so we will want to watch him and hope that the lifestyle changes will change that. Mike would not have known he was at risk from a routine physical. You can't always rely on routine testing to identify your cardiovascular risk factors. We all have two different kinds of cholesterol, HDL, which is known as good cholesterol, and LDL, known as bad cholesterol. The case of late journalist Tim Russert shows why advanced testing is important. Sudden heart attack killed Russert at age 58. Russert had normal cholesterol levels in routine testing, but autopsy showed he had advanced heart disease. You can't always rely on routine testing to identify your cardiovascular risk factors. Treatment as usual will get you killed. You've got to look much more deeply. LDL stands for low density lipoprotein. There are two kinds of LDL particles that we all have. Small and dense, which are the dangerous kind called pattern B, or large and fluffy called pattern A. Those particles can actually work their way through the cell wall um, into the area just underneath the intima of the artery and form plaque, which ultimately gets bigger 
and here ruptures, that's a heart attack, forms a clot, occludes the artery, and uh, unfortunately many times kills your patient. Knowing your particle number and size is so important, but routine tests don't measure it. Remember, the small, dense particles are dangerous. As good as this is, and it's very popular among our physicians, it isn't enough oftentimes to let you know what risk you're truly facing. What we most frequently do is an advanced test called the NMR. The NMR is a magnetic resonance scan of your blood. It gives us particles. It gives us the particle number. It lets us know what particles, how many big particles there are, how many small particles there are, and another beautiful thing that this test does is it gives us a second look at insulin resistance. I look for a reason to order the NMR because the NMR adds so much more information to the routine testing. Mike is overweight, nearing obesity. Over two-thirds of American adults are overweight or obese. On an average, people who are considered obese pay 42% more in health care costs than a normal weight person. Obesity can lead to other health problems. The health risks associated with obesity and being overweight are astounding. They include type 2 diabetes, high blood pressure or hypertension, high cholesterol, stroke, heart attack, congestive heart failure, cancers of the colon, prostate, rectum, uterus, gallbladder, and breast, gallstones, gout and gouty arthritis, osteoarthritis, and many others. Chief Hernandez has scheduled sessions with nutritionist Karen Bain and exercise physiologist Bill Land, who can help him improve his risk factors. Bill and Karen have been looking over Mike's chart prior to seeing him. In 10 days, Mike has already lost eight pounds. I was given a book to read about the diet and what causes people to be obese. And um, because of that, I, I pretty much modified my, my diet, uh, started watching portion size, and um, uh, restricted my, my carbohydrates, and of course my sugars. And in about 10 days, I've managed to drop about eight, eight pounds. Eight to, eight to ten pounds, give or take a little bit. Once I decided this is what I wanted to do and I set my mind uh, as a goal, it was relatively easy. Size piece, but Karen gets the first. dietitian. Okay, hi, Hello. Karen. How are I you? am the dietitian that um, sees all of the clients who come through our program. I meet them where they're at, and that's the bottom line for lifestyle change. What influences their eating behaviors? As a health and wellness coach, I'm going to really let the client lead. I'm in a high stress job. Uh, I don't eat regularly. I'm not giving them a diet. I'm not telling them the do's and don'ts. I'm guiding them. Give me your wellness vision. And it's a simple, I want to what? So that I can what? You know, think long term wise. Uh, my vision statement is, is pretty simple. I'd like to get down to my optimal weight and incorporate an exercise program that, that is functional within my current work schedule. Lifestyle change can diet. be small steps, it could be large steps, but steps over time add up to big changes. We want to help them drive themselves to wellness. Education is critical. As they understand how and why, it makes it a lot easier for them to move forward in their wellness. Typically, Physicians tell people to go exercise or go on a diet, but they don't give them very specific information. And that's the number one complaint from patients uh, nationally as well as locally. The feedback we get is that, you know, people have told them to do it in the past, but they just don't get the specifics or the tools that enable them to achieve any success. The nutritionist uh, and I are really careful about individualizing the program to what the patient is interested in doing. And if they're ready to do it, psychologically, they they may have a mild interest, but they haven't started the plan yet. So we try to find out where in that in that curve they are. Muscle, organ, skin. And a lot of these guys think they need to really work it hard every day to get a benefit, and that's not quite true. It's the volume of activity that they do over time, the total amount of activity they do. And quality is important, but not in every workout. So as long as you get, say, one quality day a week, that's all you need to do. Even if you are generally 
fit if you spend a lot of time at a desk or a computer or t watching TV that inactivity is a risk factor also. A mic is uh, pretty typical of what we get with fire and policemen. Big guys, they, they have a lot of muscle mass so they can, they can weigh a little bit more and they're often relieved to find out that their weight goal uh, is not as drastic as, as something we come up with. And the real goal on recheck is to make sure that while he's losing weight, he's not losing the lean mass, the, the muscle mass. And that can happen if you go on a, a caloric restricted diet uh, and you lose weight with diet as opposed to exercise. So that's why it's important to continue to exercise, moderately cut your intake, and do some resistance training to help preserve that lean body mass. His LDL cholesterol is a little elevated, that's the bad cholesterol. His particle numbers are a little higher than we like. He's got too many of the small particles, which are the dangerous particles that form the plaque. And so two things that'll change that are diet and exercise. And what that does is it takes that small, dense particle that's dangerous and makes it larger and fluffier. So weight loss and exercise both can, can change lipids some. And you usually have to give that process anywhere from, say, 10 to 12 weeks. If he's, if he's vigilant, he should get a good change. And if he's not going to get a change in that period of time, he maybe have to go on some medication for, this, for the cholesterol. I've had a couple of, of temptations, if you will. You know, you, you drive by a billboard and you see a big juicy hamburger advertised and, and uh, two miles away is a, is a burger place. And, and um, it, it's tempting to want to pull in there and... and um, kind of fall off the diet, if you will, but um, I'm pretty focused at, at uh, reducing my overall weight and getting in better shape, so it's keeping me on track. One common risk factor of Mike and Todd not tested for, job stress. What we do is different, and many times it's different because at the end of that day, the decisions you make are about life and death. We work 24-7. We don't turn the lights off at 5 o'clock. Those men and women are on the street 24-7, street all right? You leave the briefing room, and really your, your, your working heart rate, your heart rate right there is, is at 100. Being a, a street patrol officer is you're, you're always trying to um, be in the know, see, be aware of what's going on in your surroundings. It can consume you. It can consume your life. It can consume your day. That's just a constant mindset that, uh, unfortunately, we have to develop in our job to um, be safe. They're rolling to a call at 1.20 or 1.30. I think police officers take that stuff for granted. It's not something you're aware of. You just get used to it. Only 31% of U.S. adults report they engage in regular physical activity. About 40% report no physical activity. Fitness is a huge cardiovascular risk factor. An ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. And I will take that to the grave because I really think if I spend couple hours with somebody doing some injury prevention stuff that that's going to save me 10 hours with them down the road. I really feel that um, uh, exercise is the great regulator. We see kids all the time that can't, can't do basic things and they sit on their butts all day long and now all of a sudden they're eating garbage and now all of a sudden they're overweight and then they don't want to move. We've just created this lazy society from the get-go and we've got to go back to some very easy fundamentals and implement those in early and create a habit and a lifestyle that's going to prevent the problems that we're seeing. There he is. Hey Mike, how are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm good. We're going to find out how good you are early. How much uh, weight did you lose? Uh, I went from 236 to uh, 206 pounds, so about 30, 30 pounds. 30 pounds, so you lost more than 10% of your body weight. Yes. Congratulations, sir. <laughs> well, it's it's just a pleasure to do follow-ups like this. Your particle number has decreased 527 points. That's remarkable. The small, dense, and dangerous particles have decreased from 877 to 103. That's spectacular, so you've lost 774 of the small particles. You're just an incredible example of how lifestyle alone, without any medications, um, can produce dramatic changes. My primary motivation was my family history of diabetes, uh, the fact that um, I was overweight and I just didn't feel good. I, um, you know, I felt bad in the morning getting up, I felt bad going to bed, 
uh, throughout my day. I was tired. Uh, I didn't have the energy that I needed to make it through the day. When I got into the program, uh, the first two weeks were a challenge, but once I got past that 14th, 15th day, I started to notice that my energy level was up. Uh, I was feeling better, and now that I'm several months, actually over three months into the program, uh, I feel great. It's good to feel good. You know, firefighters are very competitive by nature, and when they see someone doing something and they see the results, and they hear how, uh, uh, you know, they hear about the benefits, they of course want to, they want to tag along, and uh, and then it becomes more of a competition within the station. You know, who's doing, who's who's lost the most weight, uh, whose whose numbers are down in terms of their, you know, their cholesterol counts. We cannot sustain the rise in healthcare cost without moving to a prevention, looking at lifestyle, looking at diet, identifying risk early. We cannot sustain that. It's 17 to 18 percent of our gross national product. That's what health care cost us today. I think chiefs in the fire service, police service, uh, and federal law enforcement and federal public safety would be, inter would be very interested in improving the uh, wellness and quality of life for their people as a number one priority. As a number two priority, with the economic challenges we face, I think it would be important to look at the numbers you could save. If you can start working on a kid right now that's 25 or 30 years old with a program like this and reduce the number of workman comps claims, all right, related to health, you know, heart, heart attack, stroke, those, those types of things, and diabetes, I mean, like I said before, that's about 1.2 million, at least by Reno standard, a person. I mean, that's a lot of money. Remember, our biggest asset is our personnel. How much money do we spend on maintenance of our engines and our trucks yearly? I think that it's not too much to ask that we spend a little bit of money on our personnel and the equipment that they represent to be able to keep our departments going and prevent, do preventative maintenance program on them like we do our engines and our trucks and our equipment.